It's not often you can say that you're going to meet a legend, but I reckon Sir Ian McKellen definitely falls in that category. You know, he's done everything from Shakespeare to, of course, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, Magneto in X-Men. But as well as being an actor, he's a gay rights activist. He's somebody uh, who obviously was a, a gay man when homosexuality was completely illegal in this country. Uh, he helped set up Stonewall in the late 80s. So I reckon we've got quite a few things to talk about. When did you start realising you had something of a, you know, a passion for acting? I had a passion for the theatre, going to the theatre. My parents went a lot, and my sister did. But, you know, I was also introduced to music. My father played the piano. We went to classical concerts. But what stuck with me of, of their introduction to life outside the home was theatre going. Not sport, not politics, no theatre. So, and, and it was watching a play that intrigued me as to how it was done. How does that scenery stand up? What, what happens when they go through that door? What, what's behind the... How do they learn their lines? How do they... How did it all work? Well, to answer that question, I became an actor myself at school, at university, more amateur acting, and by the time I'd finished at Cambridge, I thought there was nothing else I could really do that I would enjoy. But I had, up to that point, never thought I was good enough. I'd, I'd seen the great actors, you know, of our time. I never thought I could be in their company, but... Then at university there were people like Derek Jacobi uh, and, and many others who were intending to become professionals and I sort of thought, well, if Derek can do it. Can... <laughs> if Derek <laughs> Jacobi can manage it. <laughs> Did you find it a bit of a culture shock going to Cambridge from the north? Oh yes. What was very, it like? Very romantic. What was it? What was your first impressions? Did you, did you find it bewildering? How many it? beautiful young men there were <laughs> <laughs> was my first reaction. Fewer women in those days. Yeah. Uh, the women, women's colleges and men's colleges were separate. Yeah. When did you realise you were gay? Oh, well, I mean, about the time other people discover that they're not gay, you know. <laughs> when the hormones start <laughs> surging. What's it taste? I mean, I, I, the, 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 the first love affair I had was with a, with a girl of my own age. I was about 10 or 11. I, I met her recently. Did you? Mm. What did she do now? How did you meet her again? She, she and I were both seeing a play at the National Theatre and she came up and said, uh, I'm Wendy. So I said to her, Wendy, did you, did you keep my letters? Oh, yes, yeah, she said. She kept your she letters? Kept them. She said, but I have to say that the day I got married, I, I burnt them all. Oh, outrageous. So but you're worth thousands the, now. <laughs> there oh. must have been something in the letters which appealed to her. After Wendy, um, no, I've been pretty constantly attracted to her. Um, men. So, I mean, that's the thing, because today, I mean, if you're gay today, it's, it's not some sort of utopia, there's still, you're far more likely to have mental distress than others, you face physical, verbal abuse, mm. most people wouldn't risk holding hands in public, but no. of course, it was completely illegal in this country, it was well, illegal you, to be who you were. It was just the law of the land, and, and people like me were queer, that was the, the word, that was the nicest word that was used about us. By definition, we were queer, we were odd, we were peculiar. Strange, different, queer. Well, if you think that about yourself, it's not good. I, I was deeply closeted, unable to talk to my parents about it. I felt not a subject that was meant on the school curriculum. So it was only when I got out of school, um, away from family, away from church, and all those influences that I arrived in Cambridge and discovered there were other boys like myself. We, we called ourselves camp, not, 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 not queer. Did you ever suffer homophobic abuse in any of these periods? No. You, you never... Well, nobody knew I was gay. Lucky, wasn't I? Because I, I, I found myself working with people who didn't care whether you were gay or straight or ambidextrous. It was, um, it, uh, were you good at your job? Did you work hard? Uh, are you a serious actor? Mm -hmm. These are the questions they asked you. So no discrimination against me at all, until the point at which I came out, and then there was a barrage of death threats, and, uh, and, and, and when, when the Bishop of uh, Glasgow says you're the son of the devil because he's heard you tear out bits of the Bible that you don't approve of, uh, these become badges of pride rather than anything else. So, Were you no. upset, though? Were you upset by that? No, because I knew I was right and he was wrong. You came out in 1988 on radio. Did I, yes. There was a law going through Parliament uh, called Section 28. It, of course, banned the promotion, so-called, of homosexuality in schools. It was so insulting to, to, to young people to think that they 
shouldn't have minds of their own. And that if they were told about homosexuality, that they would all be converted to it. Mm -hmm. As if you could promote. Yeah. You can't promote sexuality. You can talk about mm -hmm. it. You can't recommend it. I mean, I was recommended uh, heterosexuality all my life. Uh, I'm still gay, and I think the reverse is probably true. I, I, have you ever met anybody who came out and was honest about their sexuality who regretted it? No. Never. It is astonishing. Though. Yeah. That, well, that phrase... It is totally positive. It is mm. totally for the good of yourself, your friends, your family and society. Of course it is. So all those years of repression were, were, were lifted. But I, I'm still very angry about it. Uh, and, and society treated us unfairly and, and cruelly and without thought and without compassion and uh, made the world a worse place. One thing I have to say, and it's a big part of, 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 of gay rights in this country, uh, we got people to discuss sexuality on the back of the discussion which society was having to have about AIDS, which was a deadly disease. The world sort of educated itself because for the first time in discussing HIV AIDS, you had to discuss the idea that people had sex and discuss what sort of sex it was, what it actually entailed, uh, in order to save their lives. Mm -hmm. now, uh, so this wasn't salacious, this, this was a, a positive move. Once you were discussing the fact that gay people had sex together and were affectionate in all sorts of uh, ways in private, it became less, um, can be less interesting <laughs> and less threatening, less remarkable. Uh, oh, I see, they do pretty well what mm. we do, do uh, straight people say to themselves. That they enjoy themselves. And of course you helped to found Stonewall V. I I did. I, I, it occurred to me uh, on the advice of, of uh, directly, they advised me from a, a conservative whip whose job it had been to help pass Section 28, make it law. He said to me, mm, well, that's a bit of red meat thrown to the right wing walls by Mrs Thatcher. That's his exact phrase. He said, if you're going to stop it in future, you've got to organise. You've got to be ready for it when it happens. Start a gay lobby. Um, something you're very proud of, I know, is... So there's the book of Thomas More. It's quite topical, isn't it? So, in the middle of this play, Sir Thomas More, is a, a speech that he delivers. He's a lawyer and he's sent out to put down a riot in, in the middle of London. And the riot is against the presence of what they call strangers. Immigrants, really. People who come from somewhere else and... Yeah, so someone in the crowd says uh, that the strangers sh should be removed, and Thomas More says, well, grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs with their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silenced by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled. And by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man, for other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with self-same hand, self-reason, self-right, would shark on you. And men like ravenous fishes feed on one another. And then he goes on to say, uh, imagine what it would be like if you were exiled. You were sent out of the country just for being what you are. Well, it's a speech that can apply to a, a, any uh, abused minority, uh, but particularly relevant at the moment because of the uh, refugee situation. But migrancy has been going on for a long time. It has. <laughs> but a bit of that humanity imported from a few centuries ago, maybe. Yes. Won't, won't and go it's, uh, he was obviously rather pleased with the speech. I think it's a fair copy. It's not. It's not him painfully deciding how to write it. It's, he'd written it, he liked it, he wrote it down, and, and there it is uniquely. You want theatre to be accessible, don't you? Everything should be accessible, Owen. And, and if it's not, it must be made accessible. That's, that's why um, I believe in, in public subsidy for enterprises whereby people's lives can be change for the better, whether it's being able to go to an orchestra for a reasonable price, mm, or mm. whether it's able to belong to a choir, whether it's able to go to see a big, pro expensive production of a great play in your own city, not mm. just having to come down to London. But you've uh, got an app. You shouldn't have to have read Shakespeare. It was never his intention. 
So the people who need to read a, a, a script are actors, not uh, students. So here we are. And I must use you in such another trick. And you can see Go, the text the rabble, going up. Whom I give the power and me speaking, rather than performing, place. speaking. You, you, you just tap on the figure and, and the word is defined for you. So the, we, we've got notes here all the time. You take it at your own pace. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Shakespeare it enters the... 21st the, century. The yeah. digital age. You and Patrick Stewart. It's, it comes across Can't as... Can't stand him. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. Because I love this show, man. Such an ego. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I admire him enormously. He left school when he was 16, you know, against all the odds. And he ended up at the Royal Shakespeare Cup, which is where I first met him. Though we weren't in the same place. And, and then I advised him not to go and do this uh, series on television. Do be careful, you've got a good career going in London. You don't, don't want to spoil it by going and being in Star Trek. <laughs> well, he didn't take that advice, and he hasn't held it against me, uh, though he brings it up quite a lot. And then uh, we really see each other when we work together. So what brought us together was um, X-Men. Sitting in the trailer for hours on end, as you have to do, mm -hmm. waiting for work, and, and reminiscing, and, and wondering, and uh, thinking, why have we not worked together before? Because we're practically the same person, you know. I know. I mean, You've merged. <laughs> Do you still have the same passion for acting as you always did when you started? I wonder if I do. I, it's so it's so ingrained in me that I have to try and stop acting now when I'm talking to you. Put your hand down there and what's that meant to look rather coy, is it? Look Owen in the face. I don't bother about the camera. You know, I'm thinking about it all the time. <laughs> acting, acting, acting. All the world's a stage. All the men and women merely players. <laughs> You are, Owen. You don't know it. You're an actor. We're all actors. The excitement, particularly, of um, the theatre is remains. And it doesn't matter to me whether I'm in drag and I'm singing a song or in the pantomime or doing a Shakespeare soliloquy, light comedy. It doesn't matter. Uh, and if the audience enjoy themselves, their enjoyment will, I think, have involved their shifting their perception of what the world is by maybe a tiny amount, but it might be crucial. And they're doing it in the company of strangers. It's a, it's a metaphor, really, for how the world should be. Be constantly out meeting other people and discovering the like-minded people who can reassure you that uh, you're not on your own. Da 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 da. <laughs> Ian, that was great. I see. That was absolutely All right, brilliant. Lovely. 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 Lov